Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Welcome to all of our Institute of Catholic Culture family and participants today for the eighth Sunday in Ordinary Time, otherwise known as the Sunday before, uh, the, before Lent. In a couple of days here, we're going to begin Lent. So um, this really is the driving theme that we have before us in our lectionary as the church in her wisdom uh, chooses particular texts to for our consideration. So get out a pen, get out a piece of paper, get out your Bible. Father Sebastian, you got a Bible over there? Got our Bibles. And uh, I'm going to give you the text here to write down for yourself. Sirach chapter 27, verse 4 through 7. Sirach 27, verse 4 through 7. We're going to look at Psalm 92. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 39 through 45. We're kind of continuing on our reading there from last week and the week before. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 through 58. Uh, so let's go back here to our Old Testament reading. Really, we have the theme this Sunday, or as, as we're reading through the text, I think you'll see that uh, the church is, is, is asking us to really consider our heart. Um, and there's an old-timey saying, as goes back to the ancient world, that you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. And if we are supposed to be givers of God's life, then we have to ensure that his life is firmly rooted in our souls. And, and really, the church is asking us to do a little soul-searching today as we uh, are standing at the gate of the Lenten season, at the beginning of the journey. Um, I've said so many times, I'll repeat here again, that, um, that Lent is a journey, and we have to pack our bags for any journey, so we better pack our bags for Lent. Uh, we have to prepare now. So I encourage you over the next few days, if you haven't considered uh, with your spouse, or your family, or, or they're in prayer uh, alone, how you're going to spend the coming 40 days, it's time to do so, so that you're well prepared for the journey. Um, and that includes some very practical things, what we're going to eat, what we're going to listen to, our entertainment, um, uh, uh, how often we're going to go to church, and so forth, to set those reasonable expectations there in our life, say, this is how I'm going to live for the next 40 days, um, and, uh, and then, and when we struggle, and we certainly will, to live up to that high standard, nevertheless, we know uh, where we should be in our, in our journey. So, um, just a little encouraging word there. Let's take a look at Sirach chapter 27, uh, verse 4 through 7. Sirach 27, verse 4 through 7. When a sieve is shaken, the husks appear. So do one's faults when one speaks. As the test of what the potter molds is in the furnace, so in tribulation is the test of the just. The fruit of the tree shows the care it has had so too does one's speech to close the bent of one's mind. Praise no one before he speaks, for it is then that people are tested. Father Sebastian, as we jump in here to our text this Sunday, this, this theme of, of speaking uh, and its relationship to the heart uh, comes up over and over again. We're going to see this in the psalm. We're going to see this uh, in, in the gospel text. We're going to see this in the epistle um, this focus upon the heart and what is in man. And I, you recently presented a series on the book of Sirach for us, a, a, a beautiful study. And I think it's helpful because when we're jumping in here, I don't know, for most of us, myself included, you know, where Sirach fit, fits in salvation history is a bit of a question mark. Okay, are we back in, you know, Leviticus? Are we up here in the time of the, the, the you know, just before the New Testament or where exactly does Sirach fit? And why does he focus upon this, uh, the purity of the heart? And it's almost speaking in, in, in ways of like the Psalms, the Proverbs here. Yeah. Uh, so the book of Sirach is a, a wonderful book. It was, unfortunately, I think many, maybe even the audience, aside from those who are regulars of the ICC, uh, 
many in the audience may are may not be familiar with the book. It also goes by another name, and that's Ecclesiasticus. That's the other name for it. So that also is a little bit of a confusion when someone's hearing the book Sirach, the title, or maybe looking for it in their Bibles, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, not to be confused with a book called Ecclesiastes, which is, sounds very similar, but Ecclesiasticus or Sirach. Sirach comes from the Hebrew name for it. Ecclesiasticus comes from the, from the uh, Greek. And it's the, the Greek name for the book that I think is helpful for us today and, uh, and uh, answers the question you're asking there, you know, of how important is this book for us in our, as we approach Lent, this Ecclesiasticus, the church book, as it was called, it was used in catechesis and preparation for people and uh, in their in preparation for their baptism as they went through Lent. So the, um, the book is uh, written sometime around 200 years before Christ. So it's in the post exilic period. It's wisdom literature. It sounds like the book of Proverbs, very similar to the book of Proverbs. It's filled with Proverbs. And as you're reading it, it, you'll hear a number of things that sound just like Proverbs from the book of Proverbs. But it's a later book, post exilic period, about 200 years before Christ. It's written by a Palestinian Jew, a Jew from, from Palestine, from Jerusalem, that region. And his grandson translated the book when he was in Egypt uh, shortly after the death of his grandfather. So that's the, the basic history. And as you mentioned, all that historical stuff we dealt with in the ICC lecture on the book. So I'm just going to take you one step further with that and ask you what's going on in the life of God's people that there's a, a bit, it seems like here, as there is in Proverbs, a bit of soul searching, a bit of a, like a, a pastoral reminder to be maybe nice about the whole business that, that um, of course, whenever there's an encouragement to, to live a certain way, there's an indication that maybe God's people are not living that way. Uh, what's going on here 200 years before Christ? Paint that picture for us and, the, and, and God's people and their expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Sure. Yeah, the, we get a, a hint at some of the problems in the prophet Malachi, which is a bit earlier than this book, but still in the post exile period. And I think you've done a number of studies for the ICC on this, and it's come up in a number of studies that that first chapter of the book of Malachi, where we hear the people are offering sacrifices of lame animals so that they can do what they think they're supposed to do to fulfill the, the requirements of the law. The law says you must sacrifice this type of animal on this type of a day, whatever, you know, all these regulations. And so the people are offering lame animals, animals that are sick. These are animals that anyone would typically, any rancher would cull from the herd or would sell off. And so what they're doing is they're taking the animals they would just, they would cull, they would get rid of, and they're offering those to God as a sacrifice to fulfill their, what they think is their obligation. God has given them this law, they must do this, must do this. And so they're offering animals that, that, that they think are going to fulfill that obligation. In the end, what they're doing is they're treating God as if he's a pagan God, as if somehow the sacrifices are going to affect him, as if he's hungry. Uh, the pagans thought when they sacrificed, they, they were feeding their gods. And so he's, you know, so God confronts them in Malachi chapter one and says, I don't, I'm not hungry. I don't need your food. I don't need you to feed me. Just take one of those animals and offer it to one of your governors and see if they'll accept it. And, and then he, he tells them that they need to change their heart because the purpose of sacrifice, of offering from what they have, is intended to change them. And unless it's something which they have to offer, which is going to cause a change, that is going to, it's going to hurt a bit to offer this, to, to give this thing up, this prize sheep or this prize goat, as opposed to the lame one, then there's no purpose of sacrificing then otherwise. It, 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 sacrifice in the Bible and the Judeo-Christian tradition changes the one who sacrifices it's not the one it doesn't change god you know uh, uh a couple of of thoughts here is I, I would encourage our participants to go back and read well read sirach but but maybe for a more consolidated version uh, historically what was going on uh to read malachi chapters one and and chapters two and maybe even chapter three also i mean it's just it's just very short the whole text here in malachi you could read it in about 
oh, five to 10 minutes. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a really a, a challenge for us and today, as we go about our our religious obligations as Catholics, um, to kind of I think a wake up call. Now, what are you doing here? You know, why are you doing these things? Uh, as we enter into the Lenten season, I think it's it's very uh, timely for us to say, you know, the Lord isn't blind. He's not. He's not stupid. Okay, he he realizes the intention of the heart. And if we're going about doing just the minimum, what is required by the law, then we would expect someone in a personal relationship as we are to be with the Lord to ask the question, where's your heart? You know, are you just doing these things just to kind of t- to uh, stamp your time card and so forth? Or, or are you really entering into the, this, this season that is before us, a season of repentance, a season of fasting, um, of prioritizing our life? Now there's, there's, uh, one other aspect of this text of Sirach that I want to bring out, and um, you've talked about it a bit before, but I think it's helpful as we enter into the Lenten season, and this, this image of the tree as an image of man, um, it's going to come up again and again here. In the Psalms, it mentions bearing fruit. Uh, here in Sirach, the fruit of a tree shows the care uh, that, that it has had. It, again, in the gospel text, a good tree does not bear rotten fruit, uh, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. So there's this, this image of the tree as an image of man in our moral life. Um, and I know in our studies before Father Sebastian, we've talked about the Garden of Eden as, the, um, as this kind of um, this, this icon of, of the way life is supposed to be. Um, and, and here now man is it, the, the, the two things come together, the garden and, and, and our life are brought together so that we can understand our life in terms of how a garden grows. I'm not going to ask you necessarily to comment on that, but just, I think it's good for us to remember as we enter into this Lenten season, the church uh, oftentimes goes back to the old ways in a sense, or, or goes back to that old imagery. And it's a helpful image to take a look at how, how the garden grows, to slow down our life and to see how God's garden grows just in nature. Um, and then to read these texts in that, in that way with that application. Of course, the church fathers take this to a whole other level as they're looking toward the Paschal mystery and the tree of the cross. And Christ is the fruit of that tree. And we are the ones who eat of that fruit like Adam was meant to eat in the beginning and we're restored to paradise. And that paradise is now made incarnate in the Catholic Church. Um, and, uh, and so this whole, this whole imagery of paradise and the Garden of Eden to which we're journeying towards the resurrection uh, is a theme which is going to be prevalent throughout all of our studies now, all the way towards, towards Pascha, towards the resurrection. And I think it's one to keep in mind, um, uh, to keep before us as we're, as we're reading these texts. The Psalm 92, we don't have to say much except that that, that theme continues about the, 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 uh, the tree which, is, which bears fruit and the, the flourishing palm tree. Um, and before we turn to the gospel text, I want to pull out here um, a quotation from St. John Chrysostom. Um, and, and go back to that old-timey saying I began with, you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. As we enter into the time of the fast, I think a lot of people um, struggle with the meaning of the fast, with it, what its purpose is. Um, and and, uh, and St. John Chrysostom has this beautiful quotation. You can look it up online, or we'll give you a link here on the, in, the, in the email on fasting. Um, and he says this. It's a bit of a lengthy quote, but I think it's helpful, especially as we turn to the to the, uh, to the gospel text. He says this, fasting is the change of every part of our life because the sacrifice of the fast is not the abstinence, but the distancing from sin. Are you fasting? Show me your fast with your works. Which works? If you see someone who is poor, show him mercy. So again, we're going back to these Old Testament readings and even the New Testament bearing fruit, that, that fasting is not simply a setting aside of things, but it's a setting aside of distractions for a purpose, 
It says setting aside of sometimes good things in our life for a further purpose. And this is what he says, show me your mercy. If you see an enemy, reconcile with him. If you see a friend who is becoming successful, do not be jealous of him. If you see a beautiful woman on the street, pass her by. In other words, do not only, sh not only should the mouth fast. Now notice here for a second, for those that would say, you know, we don't have to keep the fast. Okay, It's not necessary to abstain from, from these things, uh, food and so forth. He doesn't say that. So not only, so he expects the mouth to fast, but not only should the mouth fast, but the eyes and the legs and the arms and all other parts of the body should fast as well. Let the hands fast, remaining clean from the stealing, from stealing and, and, and greediness. Let the legs fast, avoiding uh, roads which lead to, to sinful sights and so forth. He says, let the hearing fast. And, and okay, you are, you're not eating meat, are you? You should not be, eat debauchery with your eyes as well. Let the mouth fast from disgraceful and abusive words, because what gain is there when on the one hand we avoid eating chicken and fish, and, and on the other we chew up and consume our brothers? He who condemns and blasphemes is as if he has eaten brotherly meat, as if he has bitten into the flesh of his fellow man. It is because of this that Paul frightened us, saying, if you chew up and consume one another, be careful that you do not annihilate yourself. You did not thrust your teeth into the flesh of your neighbor, but you thrusted bad talk into his soul. You wounded it by spreading disfame, causing inestimable damage, both to yourself, to him, and to many others. He goes on, and again, we'll link this, this, this text. Um, so it's important as we consider this, the fast that is before us and what we're going to be nourishing ourselves with, that we're looking forward to also what we're going to be doing uh, to what the, the good fruit that we're going to be bearing uh, by the grace of God. And so th this, this theme is brought up here in Psalm uh, 92. Let's take a look at the gospel text, Father, in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 39. Luke chapter 6, verse 39. Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 39 through, um, oh, I had it here, through 45. And again, we're, we're continuing on now this, this reading that we've been doing over the last few weeks. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher. But when fully trained, even every disciple will be like his teacher. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the splinter in your eye when you do not even notice the wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your eye first. Then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from th thorn bushes nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of, of the goodness of his heart produces good, but an evil person out of the store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Father Sebastian, again, if you could give us the context in which uh, Jesus is speaking here. It sounds very similar, by the way, as I'm reading that, to the end of the Gospel of Matthew as he's saying, woe to the Pharisees. It's, it's, it's a re rather hard-hitting text to, of, of, of kind of like an internal searching, you know, you whitewash tombs and you, all of this, you know, um, it's a bit of a warning here. But of course, it doesn't come from that part of the gospel, does it? Well, it doesn't, but you're, you're definitely right. It's related because this is the, it, when Luke's gospel, this is called the Sermon on the Plain, for lack of a better term. But it's, it's the Sermon on the Mount that we know from Matthew's gospel. We've talked about that before. It's this, this long teaching he gave when he was up there in the hills just above the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee there. And in that teaching, he begins by telling them that there, and this is Matthew's gospel, he tells them, your righteousness must exceed that of a scribe or a Pharisee. And then he goes on to tell them, and he enunciates for them the principles that are behind the law. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not kill, murder. I say, do not even be angry. 
you heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. I say, don't even lust, right? After, and we've, we've been reading these from the Old Testament as well. So, and from your quotes from St. John Chrysostom there. So, uh, so in the context of the, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, there are Pharisees standing there listening to Jesus. And in the sermon, in this sermon, he goes after him. He says, don't be like the hypocrites who will go out and, and, uh, and uh, they fast. And when they fast, they disfigure their faces so people can see that they're fasting. Or they pray out in the open on the street corner so that people know, oh, look at that guy praying. All of these things are outward expressions that, as Jesus is saying, is not reflecting really what's in their heart. And, uh, and so you're, you're definitely right. This is, this is Jesus in the early stage of his ministry, and he's confronting and challenging the religious authorities and teachers of the time, the Pharisees. And, and then, of course, at the end, like you said there in Matthew chapter 23, just before, when he's in Jerusalem, uh, he finally, he, he just comes out and, and tells them what they are. They're a bunch of hypocrites, he says. Hypocrites. Yeah. You know, on the on the flip side, of course, he also has his his apostles in front of him, and you've mentioned many times about this time uh, in the gospel as a time of like a boot camp. Um, and I remember being on the uh, the the Mount of Beatitudes right there in that area and reading this um, this text, kind of for a first time, if you will, because when you're in the Holy Land, that's just the way it is. For the first time, you're reading it, no matter how many times you've read it before. And it appeared to me in reading this text as, um, yes, you've got, in some sense, the Pharisees are standing at the edge and he's, and he's reminding them not to live like that, you know, like the whitewashed tombs. But there's a positive instruction here also for his apostles who are, he's about to send out, am I right, that in, the, in the gospel text, he's about to send them out in their mission, right? Um, and I think is this interesting thing is, is the church is really focusing on this aspect of bearing fruit. And I don't think oftentimes people consider Lent as a time for fruit bearing. They think of it as a time for pruning. And it certainly is that. It certainly is a time for pruning. But the pruning's for a purpose, isn't it? And, um, and, uh, and here, I think, uh, I think it's, it, there's a, a reminder here if we place ourselves in the context of what Jesus is saying to his apostles, and again, Father, am I right? This is just right here in this, in this context of about to send them out on their mission. Am I right about that? Yeah, he's going to be doing that uh, shortly after this. Yeah. The, the whole, the whole Galilean ministry, a three-year ministry is crammed into, you know, just really what is really a few chapters. So right. yeah. It's absolutely, it's not too much longer after this. He's, this yeah. is teaching, and then he's going to be doing a bunch of things, showing them after this, you know, he, he's, you know, healing people, uh, healing lepers, raising re people from the dead, and then he's going to send them out. And so they've, they've heard his teaching, they've seen, how, they've, they've listened to him, they've seen what he does, and now they get to go out on kind of basically like a, a practice run and, uh, and try it out. So I'm going to give you a little gardening, a little gardening question here, okay? Uh, because I know you love to you love to grow uh, trees and fruit trees and so forth. If Lent is a time of pruning, what is the purpose of pruning? Uh, how can we understand the trimming of the things in our life which are kind of weighing us down and so forth during this Lenten season? What is its purpose? Well. You're the former landscaper. You know better than I do about all of these things. But um, but the uh, when you prune a fruit tree, you prune it so that, like you said earlier, uh, so well, so that it actually is more fruitful. You, it's a it's a hard concept. I I know when we were kids. I remember when we first had to start doing some pruning around the yard. It was it always seemed counterintuitive. I'm going to cut a few branches off. And somehow this tree is going to grow better, faster, bigger, and produce more fruit, right? How does that work? Well, we're, we're not just randomly cutting, right, when we prune. We're pruning off branches that are going to weigh this, this branch and maybe cause the tree to fall over or split. Or maybe you've got a branch that is diseased. 
I've, I've, uh, uh, I've got a plum tree outside that when I moved here, it had a lot of diseased areas on it. And so I pruned those off and then eventually pruned a little more off. And then just when we first got here, it, it was producing maybe five or 10 plums. It was, it was it. And it had all these diseased branches. And then just this last year, it, it produced, it was just loaded with plums, loaded with plums. But we had, I'd really pruned the tree back a lot. But what I was pruning back were branches that were, that were not well formed for producing the fruit and also were diseased. And I, I think that's probably what you're getting at here. Yeah, you know, actually there's, now you're, you're, as you're talking here, I wanna point out one other aspect of pruning that is important, is that you prune for sun. You open the tree up so that it can receive the sunlight. You know, you, you, there's, uh, especially those that love pruning roses, you always prune a rose like a vase, okay? And not too different from a, from a, from a fruit tree either. You know, you're, you're trying to separate those branches out the sun can get in. For those that are bored with our commentary today, I just ask you to hold with me for a second here because, because this is very valuable for Lent. Uh, we're going to cut off some branches, hopefully, and prune back some aspects of our life. Um, which may be getting in the way of the sunlight. And that's really, that's really in the coming days, uh, maybe a good question for us. What aspects of our life are getting in the way of God's grace? Um, and, uh, and, and, and there's this beautiful, you mentioned Malachi about um, in chapter three, where he talks about the heavens opening and showering down every grace from heaven, every blessing, you know, how, what things in our life are kind of like stopping that from happening. Can we set these things aside so that we can make room for the uh, God's sunshine, if you will, in our life. And, and then of course, then Lent becomes a, uh, an, a, an opportunity for mission because opportunity for rediscovery in our life, of, uh, of the fruit, bearing the fruit in our life, which God wants us um, uh, to, to bear. You know, Lent becomes not only a time of pruning, but of, uh, of, of, of bearing fruit. And, uh, and so I don't want to go too much further into that, but it certainly is an image that the church is placing before us today. And all of these readings talking about these fruit trees and the, and the palm trees and the bearing of the fruit in our life. Um, and at that image, when the, when the scriptures give us these images, they're for, a pur they're for a purpose, they, uh, and we should let them be th that. Not a bad idea to go read this text in front of a tree, and, uh, and I'm serious about that. And look how a tree grows, and, and because that's by God's design. That's an image of our life, okay? Um, now, let's take a look very, very quickly here at the epistle. Um, in conclusion, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 58. It has a, a text here, which is one of my favorites, which, which is, happens to be one of the favorites of St. John Chrysostom also uh, in his, in his uh, Paschal homily. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 58. Brothers and sisters, when this which is corruptible clothes itself in incorruptibility, and this which is mortal clothes itself in, in immortality, then the word that is written shall come about. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, steadfast always, fully devoted to the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Again, this theme of bearing fruit, uh, there, the labor that is, that is taking place here. Um, Father Sebastian, I'm just going to ask you, as I commonly do in Corinthians, uh, in his first letter, St. Paul's first letter here, what exactly is St. Paul talking about? There's a, some confusing language here that I think would be helpful to kind of understand the power of sin is the law. <laughs> the power of sin is the law. That's one that's a little hard to wrap your mind around. Um, maybe you could help us a little bit there. So uh, the law here, the Torah, Paul talks about this in other places where he says, um, he says, you're, 
one is not culpable or sin is not, is not counted where there is no law. What he means is when, when man, you know, coming out of the garden and continuing all the way up to the coming of Moses, man was operating from natural law. He would look, he could look around and see the, you know, the creation and from the creation was able to discern uh, the basics of natural law. And therefore the basics discern there's a creator who created all these things. And there's a certain, there are certain principles and rules by which these things operate. The, um, but then when, uh, when the law was revealed at Mount Sinai by Moses or by God through Moses, now man previously there's certain things St. Thomas Aquinas says, you know, the natural laws, it's easy to go back and look at it hindsight, you know, through the lens of the law given by God uh, in the special revelation. But when you're looking at the natural law, or trying to discern natural law, just simply from, from the creation, there's some fuzzy areas. And, uh, and so when the law was given through Moses, suddenly it's like, and this is what the, the, the Jew, how the Jews understood the, the Torah, like a light, for their feet. Psalm 119 verse 105, the, the law is a lamp for my feet, a, a light for my path. And so the, they now were able to clearly see what was right and what was wrong. God says clearly, you may not do this, you may do that. You may not steal, you, 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 you shall not lie, you shall not commit adultery. And so now it's crystal clear, it's been enunciated by God, it's like a light in the darkness for them. And now there, now it is, it is sin. It, it is sin before, but it is now. They're now culpable. They're now counted for that. So the power of sin, it says here, the um, the power of sin is the Torah, right? So you, the it is the law that makes you uh, considered culpable for your actions. But now he goes a step further in the in the text, and he says, "But thanks be to God." who gives us the victory. Okay, so he says it's been conquered. I think many people reading this text would be looking towards heaven, right? Well, you know, when, when, when we die and we're clothed in incorruptibility and we, all of this, we put off and so forth. And when we go to heaven, right? And we're, we're there we're floating in the clouds with the angels now, but this is not what St. Paul says. He says, thanks be to God for the victory. And then he does something very interesting based on what you're we just talking about. He turns this idea of law, and he says, well, it works. And he says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be firm, steadfast, always fully devoted to the work of the Lord. So something has changed. Uh, what, and and uh, how are we to understand this text, this, this change that has taken place in us? So we're in 1 Corinthians, the, the, um, and we can't get too much into the context, the, the Corinthian community had because they were dualists, they were denying the, the value of their, of their um, the importance of what they do with their bodies and how they live their life as Christians. Mm -hmm. Because for them, it was, as you were saying, eh, eh, when we die, we'll float off into the clouds, you know, bodiless existence or something. And so he, he, they had a problem with the idea that Jesus rose from the dead and the idea that we would therefore rise from the dead. And so in the end, what they were doing was denying their baptism. And their baptismal grace, or I could say their initiation grace, baptism, confirmation, and the reception of the Holy Eucharist, the fully initiated in the body of Christ. And, and so Paul has to address that. And so you find here in the latter part of the, of the letter a number of references to the resurrection of Christ, our own coming bodily resurrection, and, and, uh, and then what we are to do with our lives between the baptismal font and that second coming of Christ. And so that's what he's talking about here. He says... He says, you know, the, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Christ Jesus, as we've been baptized into him, we become members of his body. And we are now able to do what the law was intended to do. The law was intended to direct us to love of the one true God, our, our Father, and our neighbors, ourselves. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was like a light shining in the darkness. You know, like a flashlight and could say, aha, you are, that's what you're supposed to do, and that's what you're not supposed to. But as Paul says, the, but the law couldn't, 
couldn't help you do it. It could only show you what was right and was wrong. It couldn't do anything to enable you because the law was exterior to you. Mm. But by the power of the Holy Spirit in the new law, the new given law at Pentecost, the new Pentecost, the word of God has become in us. We have become, we receive the law within our hearts on the tablets of our heart. We become through our baptism, our confirmation, our reception of the Holy Eucharist, receiving the word himself in our flesh, we are now able to do what the law was intended us to do, to love God and our neighbors ourselves. We're able to actually fulfill that because we have become the law himself. You know, um, I think it's a, a great place to kind of come to a conclusion here by going back to the first few verses of this, of this epistle. Um, because it is brothers and sisters, when this which is corruptible clothes itself in incorruptibility, and here, of course, St. Paul's talking not about going off into, going off into heaven, but, but, but uh, the transformation taking place in our baptism. Uh, he says in Romans chapter 6, what are you doing continuing in sin? The grace may abound. They may continue in sin that more God can form. It says, absolutely not. Don't you realize that you've already died to sin? Uh, and, and now death no longer has dominion over Christ. Death no longer has dominion over us. This time of the Lenten season that is before us is a recovery of this reality. Um, and uh, it's this, it, this whole Lenten season, and I think it's important to remember as we see the catechumens in our churches um, preparing for the entrance into the church on, on Easter, on Pascha, on the Feast of the Resurrection, that we are to journey with them uh, to put off the old man and to recover uh, in us that the grace of the, the baptismal robe, which we receive, the grace of the Father, um, like the prodigal son, uh, during this season. And I want to encourage our participants as we come to this, this Sunday before Lent um, to, to consider how we will spend the, the coming days, the coming weeks, um, and seriously consider going to Holy Confession uh, in the coming days as we prepare ourselves for the beginning of this journey. Do not take it lightly. I know that, okay, maybe we've had so many Lents in our lives and so many Paschas and Easter's in our lives, and this may be the last one we're given here on this earth, and, and to take this opportunity seriously for this journey that all of us might cross the sea of Great Lent and behold the bright light of the resurrection of Christ our God. To him be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Jesu, quoi bello tu, non caspici.